Thank you very much and thank you everybody for coming this afternoon. I'm here to talk about our signature uh, program which is the Ultra Deep Mining Network. And without further ado, we'll just get straight into that to say what we're trying to do is to improve mine productivity in deep underground mines. And in the context of Ontario and Quebec, that typically means about 8,000 feet, 2.5 kilometers. Uh, the challenges there, as we all know, are heat and geotechnical stress. We have a four-way program, rock stress reduction, energy reduction, material transportation and productivity, and improving human health and effectiveness underground. In case any of you think you're going to be mining with no people underground, if we have people underground at depth in these conditions, we have to have a different microclimate for them to work in. This is the scale of the program. It's a $46 million program. That's the only number here that's fixed because the number of projects and the number of network members that we have are changing all the time, but that's the scale of the operation that we currently have at the present time. And our objective is actually to, first of all, help industry adopt commercially viable R&D results. So we actually fund R&D projects, but our role is to get those things commercialized and become effective in the mining industry and to help uh, the development of those proven techniques and technologies and make sure they move through commercialization. So that's the purpose of the network. Why network at all? Some people will say we can just as easily do that on our own and you absolutely can. So if you think about companies that want to do their own thing, they have 100% control of the project they want to study. They get 100% of the benefit very quickly because that's the object of the exercise. But they also carry 100% of the cost and 100% of the risk of that project. Uh, we've done some contract work for Rio Tinto, for example, and our role there was to assemble the technical teams necessary to do the work that needed to be done and also then leverage government funds to reduce the cost. The program that we run most often with most different, with the largest number of participants is actually the collaborative model, where again we're assembling the technical teams to do the work that needs to be done, leveraging government funds to reduce the cost but also linking project partners, other different, different mining companies together to meet a common objective and to share the cost and the risk of doing that. And finally then to seek out commercial partners, typically in the SME market, the service and supply sector, who will take those technologies and techniques and move them through commercialization into the marketplace, which is a crucial part of the whole process. So that's the purpose of having a network. Uh, the NEM members that we have at the present time, those are the mining companies that are part of the network, Valet, uh, Glencore Sudbury, KGHM, Glencore Kid, I Am Gold and Ignico Eagle. And this is the host of SMEs and institutions that we're working with to make all those projects move through the system into the marketplace. That's the scale of the contributions that we have. The important thing here is to see the contribution of the service and supply sector companies, all small companies, but roughly 25% of the total fund is provided by them. And big mining companies, the industry operators, are 27%. So it's very close to 50-50, two years ago. And we completed a second application just in the last year or so, where in actual fact, 100% of the funds came from the SME market, and almost none of it from the major mining companies. Because it's the SME companies first of all, that can move products through into the marketplace and support them in the marketplace. And second of all, they have nowhere else to go except to improve their offerings into the marketplace to ensure the future of their companies. They are not going to be moving from deposit to deposit across the world. So, that's the application. That's what we're trying to do. And that is the scale that we're working on now. The ramp up last, this current year, 2015, is about seven and a half million dollars expenditure. And next year which will be the first year of steady state operation. It'll be about $13 million expenditure on this program. And it will stay there roughly for the next two to three years before we start to ramp down. The program actually has a continuation of the next five years. And if we're successful with that, then the ramp down will not happen. And we'll continue around about this 10, 11, 12 million dollar per year expenditure. So just to give you a quick snapshot of one example from each of the four areas that we're looking at, rock stress reduction, rock stress and geotechnical issues are always with us. This is the, the largest project that we have and it's using hydrofract technology to condition the ground conditions around slopes to improve the performance of our open sloping, to stop the closure of holes, for example, drill holes, etc. That's why we're working with Shell and Nexon and other companies out in Alberta who have that expertise and they're bringing that expertise 
into our minds here. So that's that program. Uh, obviously, energy reduction, there's several things there. We obviously are working on alternative power systems for our equipment, the electric. Engines is the simplest answer, but it's not actually the answer at all. We're now looking at battery and other options. And some of those are actually in considered with uh, hydraulic air compressor. This is actually technology that's over 100 years old that's been revamped for the modern era. And it's a very inexpensive way to produce compressed air. And one step on beyond that is another approach that says we should actually be trying to find uh, cooling systems using liquid air. And we're looking at that also. So those are some of the things that are working in that particular environment. Material transport and productivity, for us, the, our first target issue was essentially uh, advance rates and trying to increase advance rates. Over the last 20, 30 years, advance rates have deteriorated rapidly as the equipment has increased in size and power and sophistication. In rock bursting conditions in Northern Ontario, our advance rates are typically about three metres per day or less. Because now we have rock bursting at the face and that obliges companies to bolt and mess the face every round. That slows the advance rate dramatically. As you know, if you're trying to make your way to a new deposit, the advance rate dramatically impacts your net present value of the project. That's one of the objectives. And so we have this system that we've developed, a series of canopies working together in, in, uh, in concert. This one has the face, gate, face mesh on the front, just for the face, if you have that problem. If not, it doesn't matter. The main objective of the exercise is to have two activities happening in the drift at the same time. So drilling and charging at the face, while the permanent ground support system is being installed at the back. The middle canopy is really just to allow travel between the two places. What we've done there is to shorten the critical path of the development cycle. That's the objective of the exercise. It's not that easy, however, because sometimes if you're blasting at the end of shift, all you're doing is creating more lost time in the shift. The crucial piece then is to move on to continuous mucking systems at the face, which can remove rock from the face faster, and that takes us to two 3.5 meter rounds per day, more than double the rate of advance. And finally, just to move on to this one, heat stress, improved human health conditions. Uh, already, many mines in the north are working with work rest regimes. And what we look, want to look at are things like personnel condition, monitoring and intervention communication systems. If anybody has a serious health incident 8,000 feet below surface, the chances of surviving that event are very small unless we have the opportunity to understand what's happening and be able to intervene before the event actually occurs. That's one of our objectives with this. These photographs are just, they're not specific at all because this is actually quite confidential work for our clients who are working in this business now. And you can imagine <coughs> wearables is a common technique, but for our specific purposes, it's not just a question of putting on a wristband because we're in very hot, humid conditions and we have to dissipate the heat. And so simply having a suit that we put cold air into is not the answer. It's a lot more complicated than that. It was my answer at the beginning, but I'm now fully aware that it's not the answer and we have people working on that answer. So those are four specifics. I said before, that the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation, this is only one subset of what we do. So that's the scale. We have five themes altogether. The deep mine theme, which is to reduce the problems of high rock stress and high temperature, and also improve the productivity of our mines, is what this ultra deep mining network is about. But we also have a fine mine theme, which is to increase the rate of discovery of new deposits, and also accelerate the rate at which we can open up those deposits to operations. And finally, improve the performance environmentally of our industry. We may think that case by case by case, Whenever there's an incident somewhere in the world, and there usually is a dam failure somewhere in the world once a year, or more often, that's an issue for that company. It is not. It's a credibility issue for the industry as a whole. And it impacts every new mine that's coming along because questions are asked about how we will perform in that area. And finally, these are the four technical areas that we work in, but we have a whole biz mine section because we have to put all of this technical development into a business context. We're not simply doing this as a technical exercise. One of our criteria for selecting projects is how much of an impact will it have on the business of mining. If it doesn't have a significant impact, it's not a project for us to be working on. It may be an interesting academic project to work on, 
but it's not part of what we do. And that helps to take us towards a definition of where we are. I'll just finish off with this to say, these are all the companies that we're working with globally. So although we're based in Sudbury, Sudbury's not a bad place to, do, to be because mining innovation will be done in mines somewhere. It's not going to be done in Toronto or Montreal or Vancouver. It will be done in mines in Val d'Or, in Timmins, in Sudbury or someplace else. So that's why we are where we are to do what we do. As the uh, Centre for Excellence in Mining Innovation, we have over 129 projects completed with about 28 different institutions within Canada. $33 million of the, all that expenditure has been spent at mines to make things happen. $15 million has been spent with SMEs to take that through into commercialization. And only six million of that actually in the research sphere itself. So we fund all three levels of activity to make these things move through into the marketplace. This is the easiest way we've found to explain the difference between research and innovation. You can see on the left hand side you have the universities engaged in fairly low level technical readiness level means readiness for the marketplace. Basic research is number one because it's nowhere close to being ready for the marketplace. The other ones at seven, eight, seven, eight and nine are there almost just for commercialization. The difficult place to be is in the middle, taking products through from the research phase into the commercialization phase. In actual fact, what we've discovered in the last three years is there's really no lock, lack of innovation. The problem is not an innovation gap, the problem is a commercialization gap. There are lots of very, very good ideas it's just sometimes not easy to find people with very good technical ideas with very good business sense. And that's the missing link. And so that's what we're spending our time to work on. Essentially what we're saying here is that research is not the same as innovation. And SEMI's job is to focus on the innovation uh, piece. There are lots of people doing the research piece. And there have been for many, many years. We have lots of reports sitting on a shelf that got through the research phase and were never implemented. We've even got some things that were implemented as a trial and they're rusting away in the back 40, never to be used again. We're actually trying to rejuvenate some of those things and bring them forward. New business is created by innovation and it's important to know what that's composed of. It's, yes, it can be new knowledge from a research piece. It's certainly old knowledge as well. It's certainly practical ingenuity to help make that thing work in the settings in which we have them. And finally, business acumen. If there's no support in the marketplace for a new piece of technology, it will fail. And if it fails, it will not be adopted by industry as a whole. That's the crucial part of the puzzle for us. So we're actually trying to s s position ourselves here in this innovation phase in the middle here. And we have the Ultra Deep Mining Network, which is still working on technical programs here. And then we have what we call the Innovation and Prosperity Office, which is exclusively composed of individuals with business acumen, business experience, because their job is first of all to help the products of the Ultra Deep Mining Network make it into the marketplace. And when, while we were doing that with the, the uh, SME innovators, we also found that they had other innovations themselves that they were struggling with technical pieces of the puzzle that they didn't have solved. So it works both ways now so that we work with the SMEs, find them the technical innovators they need to complete the piece of their puzzle, and then allow them to take their own particular innovation into the marketplace. The crucial factor is the marketplace and how that happens. So uh, just to say we actually have some successful commercial agreements now, uh, two are complete. One is with Nordic Mine Steel for the canopy. They're the constructor and seller of the canopies and that will move forward. The second one is coal block technologies, something we started to support four years ago now. So if you think this is a quick business, it's not. It's a lot of time and effort to move these things through the system, but that's what our business has to do. Coal block technologies is sample digestion for drill core. Each sample with very aggressive acids used to take two hours with this process and now takes 10 minutes. And it needs only normal acids like sulfuric and hydrochloric rather than hydrofluoric hydrofluoric acid. So much, much safer and it also makes it possible to batch this whole process. So now we can be doing 8 and 10 and 16 batches very, very quickly rather than just the one. So this is a tenfold increase sample by sample multiplied by 10. 
So that's a hundredfold increase in performance because that re now redirects the drilling program to say, stop drilling here, think of somewhere else to drill instead, or vice versa. And the last two that we're still working on don't have agreements with, uh, with Revolution and with uh, Objectivity. We're hoping to move through that very quickly. That's not the last piece because we've also discovered that through this whole process there is a role for the last piece and that was our last submission uh, that was 100% supported by the SMEs which is to create an innovator investment program to get some of those small companies to move over the hump and to get that new thing into the marketplace. Again, there's not a lot of support for that type of activity. So here we are. Everybody understands three different types of innovation. Core innovation, which is close to continuous improvement. Adjacent innovation means adopting existing technologies from other industries and bringing them into mining. A good example might be tunnel boring machines, for example. And of course, the radically new things. And you can spend a lot of time and money in the right-hand box and end up with nothing. So our strategy is to spend most of our time in the two left-hand boxes and only occasionally dip into the right-hand box if we see a particularly good opportunity. The typical approach is research and development, that's the conventional approach, and that's composed entirely of people who love to do technical work. Even implementations in trial settings are also done by technical work. Technical people who love to do that kind of work. The last piece of the puzzle is the crucial piece, and it's the kind of people you need to do all the businessy things. And technocrats, university professors, students, etc., have no interest or very little interest <coughs> in doing any of that kind of work. So, roughly 40% of the senior people in SEMI, including uh, Pat Dubroy, who's here with me today, are business people. They're not mining people. Living and working in Northern Ontario, we can find lots of people who know lots about mining. We need to find people who will help us take our new mining technologies and move them into the ma marketplace, and that's business acumen, not technical expertise. So here's the other piece of the puzzle. We think of sustaining change and continuous improvement and this is disruptive change, but even this is disruptive change. And our objective, as was mentioned earlier, is not to increase by 10 or 15 or even 50%. It's double or triple for any single activity. Because every improvement that you make on one activity is diluted by the impact of all the things you didn't change. And so if you want to have a step change in mind performance as a whole, Individual activities have to be focused on doubling or tripling, doubling advance rates, doubling the, the cycle time of stopes by moving to paste fill, for example, doubling or tripling the effectiveness, or halving or making one third the cost of doing what we do. That's the only way to step change our industry into a far better profile for return on investment. Now, you might think those numbers are hard to achieve, but actually when you focus hard, like the advance rates, you can have to find a way to make that happen. If you don't make that happen, the innovation is not going to move through the system. It's simply not worth the effort if it's less of a target than this. Which is not to say that we always make double or triple. I've, we've actually had a project which only succeeded on 150%. And some members of the audience thought that was a failure. I actually don't think 150% improvement is a failure. It just didn't meet the target of double. Okay. We will live with that and move on to the next project. So why do we need to aim for these numbers? Because the last major innovation we had was 30 years ago. We've used economies of scale ever since. We've made slight modifications to that with slightly bigger equipment and slightly fewer people. But really, underground, there's an erosion of the benefits of uh, economies of scale because of stress and because of heat. That means that the surface and underground uh, solutions are diverging. Open pit will always be driven by economies of scale. Underground has to be driven by economies of quality. The, the quality of the work that we do, how much we trim down our production processes, how much time we do not lose, that we do not allow ourselves to lose. Anybody who's been in an underground mine will have seen many opportunities where we've wasted time and bodies doing things that are not really worthwhile. That's commonplace. It has to be eliminated entirely from what we do. And wh when I say we're punished for depth with economies of scale, it's because bigger equipment needs bigger drifts, and that needs more ventilation, and so does bigger equipment need more ventilation. Ventilation is the single largest point cost for any underground operation. 
And bigger drifts cost more money, they're slower to develop, and they produce more waste for us to move to surface. So bigger is not better for us on the ground. So it's useful sometimes to think about what should we be doing over the next five to 10 years. It's also sometimes to think about what we ought not to focus our time on. We don't actually spend much time thinking about no people on the ground because we think there always will be people on the ground. And we also think we'll definitely still be using explosives five to 10 years from now. So we're not spending any time on any of the alternatives to those things. We also think that we will not be mining with lower ventilation costs as we go deeper, nor with lower ground support costs. We'd like to make sure they don't go higher, but it won't be getting less. So what, do, what does SEMI focus its attention on? We actually focus our attention on, first of all, and primarily, streamline the production process. It will ultimately mean fewer people, but in actual fact, fewer people are joining our industry now. Our replacement rate for engineers and geologists is less than 25%. So in the future, our business will have to function with many, many fewer professionals engaged than have been in the past. And the same is true all the way down through our production system. We will have to learn to work with fewer people than we have now. And that means streaming the process. It means different ways of driving access to ore, different ways of moving and sorting ore and rock. It means different ways of keeping operations cool, of communicating with people both ways, there's lots of discussion about taking information out of the underground, taking it to a centralized control room, and very little discussion about sending the decisions or the information to make a decision back to the person at the sharp end of the business so he can make the change. Because having a decision made in a control room doesn't make an impact on daily production because the person who needs the information didn't get it. The trick is to send the right kind of information back to the people who are actually engaged in production so you can have an immediate impact on what gets done and how it gets done. That means make mines safer, more productive, and more profitable. That's our primary objective. Oh, doubled all that. So, making them safer, more productive, and more profitable is the objective of our deep mine themes and our value mine themes and the ultra deep mining network. Obviously, we're interested in improving the productivity of mines at all levels, but it's particularly critical below 8,000 feet. We also need to discover new deposits, faster and cheaper. And we have a program for that. It's called our Find Mine Theme. And we also have to open those up faster. Once we find them in a remote location, we better be able to open up transport and power uh, supply in less than a decade. Otherwise, why would anybody go exploring there. It's pointless. We need to do both of those things and do them much faster and cheaper. And finally, we really do need to manage our tailings and waste systems much more effectively than we are doing as an industry. No tailings dam failures, the definitive closure plans within 10 to 20 years of termination of production, and no unmanaged legacy sites. That's what will improve our reputation in, amongst the public at large. We have a fine line theme for that. And in all of that, it's in a business context. We don't do things that we don't think will have an impact on the business of mining. That's our primary driver, not technical interest. So to wrap up then, we think that our primary task is to improve the productivity of our mines. We can't do anything about global commodity prices. We can't even do very much about the grades that we discover but we can do whatever we can do to improve mining productivity. For us, that means mitigate the technical risks that we face. It means find ways to decrease the capital demand for new projects, because that will help them move forward. Improve the rate of return on the projects that we do have in production, and reduce our environmental impact. Our way of managing that whole process is first of all to work with mining companies and the university, colleges, and research institutions that we've done for many years. But the crucial addition we made three years ago was to include the service and supply companies to move these technologies through into the marketplace. And finally, to work in, in concert with government agencies to get the funding to make these things easier to accomplish so that our service and supply sector becomes the dominant service, service and supply sector in the mining industry globally. That's our route to success. And we would be happy to have anybody 
join the network who's not already part of what we do. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions.